Um, and I want to thank you all, mainly and firstly, because you are founders. We are all founders here. We did this, we did the exact same stuff with West Quality, you say, uh, back in 2009 with Magento. The first one was called Bargento, and we were 90. Today, we'll be 160, and we're starting again, the same story, but in another world, in the B2B world, the B2B space, but with a lot of people and faces, you know, maybe that one, we'll be back to you have a very soon. But I think it's very important to highlight the fact that today, we are in a landmark. Today, we are creating uh, among the very first uh, events around Oro Galaxy, Oro uh, Commerce, Oro CRM, Akineo. So all of those products are related to Oro. And the team, the great team of Oro, has made us the, the privilege to come to Paris in force with like your five, six, I don't know. And uh, without any further uh, speech of mine, I will give the, the microphone to Joachim Kattner. Today. Sorry for the delay, I heard there's some uh, threat over. Okay. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes? yes. All right. I'll try and uh, talk slowly, I know I sometimes talk too fast. Um, so, uh, with that, um, like I said, my name is Jörg Kuttner. I'm co founder and CEO at the company called Oro Inc. Um, and I'll explain to you a bit about Oro, what we do with Oro, and why we decided to create this uh, event here and why we want to share it with you. So, um, before we start, uh, Philippe kind of mentioned this, this is the first Oro Um Philippe and his team did an outstanding job. It looks amazing here, it looks like it's going to be an exciting day. Uh, so, I'm glad to be a part of it. And yes, we came from the US. It was the uh, last minute that I made it. I was waiting for my passport and it arrived finally, literally before I had to board the plane. So, I managed to make it. So, thank you for being here as well. Um, and hopefully, this is going to be the first of many. Um, like Philippe uh, said, we have a history going back to what we did with Magento and the community that Philippe and the French community built. We're really excited about coming to France. I was just here three weeks ago. I'm back here and I'll probably will be here at least once or twice again this year. So France is a big market for us and we definitely uh, consider as a strategic place for us to be. So I'm here to explain to you a bit about our new company and uh, what we work on. And we really like what we do. We're actually um, a team that uh, created already one product called Magento and a company called Magento myself. I uh, was the co-founder and CTO there at Magento. Uh, we established that company in 2004. I left Magento around 2012, uh, right after we were fully acquired by eBay. Uh, but I felt like it's too early, too soon to just uh, stop working, so uh, I was still too young, I thought. Um, Today I know I'm still uh, but um, luckily for me I was joined by uh, two other uh, people and that co-founded the uh, Oro with me, Jari Carter, he was the VP of Global Sales at Magento, and Dino Soroka, uh, who actually started the Magento project with me in 2007, and today is our co-founder and CTO here at Oro. Uh, we were also joined by Moti Danim, some of you already mentioned, he's uh, walking around here and uh, making sure everything is ticking, and he's our uh, COO. Uh, and Moti led uh, the Magento Go project and the SaaS initiative in Magento. And also Michael DeSolo is here with us. Michael is our VP of Engineering now. Uh, but uh, not many know he was actually the first project manager of the Magento project. And they almost won. Uh, and then uh, took over for me as the CTO of Magento for a short while before he left and joined us. So uh, great to have him. We also uh, have uh, Roy Rubin, my uh, former co-founder at Magento and uh, former CEO there. Um, and he's, and he's part of our board of advisors right now. So again, it's really good to have this team back and working. Uh, we really were excited. We kind of slowed down until we did the project, so it feels like we're back at it full speed with working at a new company. Uh, so I mentioned we founded the company in uh, 2012. Uh, and we were also lucky right because Magento was downsizing a lot of the developers. So as they were downsizing, we were hiring them. And that was a great uh, opportunity for us. Um, today we're over 160 people um, around the world. Uh, we have six offices in four countries. Our headquarters is in the uh, US, in Los Angeles. If you're ever in Los Angeles, come visit us. We have a really nice office. Not as nice as here, but uh, really nice. Uh, we also opened our first uh, company outside of the state, which is uh, in Germany. Uh, and that was a very strategic market that really took off really fast last year. 
Um, so it's something that we had to kind of adjust and create the company there as soon as possible, and we have some people on the ground in Germany. Uh, we have our dev office again uh, in Ukraine. Same thing we did with Magento. We already had a team of uh, developers there, and we built around the technology team over there. Uh, Poland is another office we opened. Uh, we have both dev and uh, business analysts there to help and support our uh, EU market. Uh, and, like I said, France is uh, one of our strategic markets, and we're looking to open uh, an office here as well. Uh, and we're hiring. So everybody brought their resumes. We'll all the interviews with the uh, And UK, uh, right up to France. That's what we were planning to do this year. Um, we started the business in 2012, and we were bootstrapped, meaning that we were funding ourselves. And it was pretty good because uh, Magento needed help running some of the larger implementations of Magento, so they paid us money to kind of help some of these implementations. We worked on projects like Corby Parker, uh, Tom Shoes, uh, Pete's Coffee, some of the bigger implementations of Magento, just to get them going and trying to save some of them. Um, so it allowed us to have some cash pretty soon. Uh, but as we started building momentum around our products, and there was a bit more success with that, we really felt like we could move much faster and more easily. So. Uh, worried about money, and uh, luckily for us, we met with Highland Europe. Uh, it's a VC here based in Europe, so not very standard to get the American company backed by VC in Europe, but we don't do standard things, and it actually makes a lot of sense for us uh, because Highland opens a lot of doors for us in the EU, which the EU and uh, UK now is a good and very um, interesting market. So if you look at how we built, about 50% of our business comes from the US. 50% the rest of the world, but about 48% of it in reality comes from Europe. So it's really um, a good partnership um, and something uh, we were really excited about. So we're backed by them today and they're really building on our strategy and what we're doing. So uh, we actually raised that $12 million last year. So what do we like doing? Well, at Aura, we're extremely passionate about creating applications and technology that helps businesses grow. That's what I've been doing for. I don't want to tell you how many years, but for the last almost 20 something years, uh, I was working with businesses, I was working with companies on technology. And as technology evolves, we love building technologies that actually work for our customers, our companies that we work with. And as such, we build flexible tools. We like to build tools that can uh, service our customers without them needing to change how they work. Like a lot of times when we work with off the shelf products, it takes the company some adjustment to learn how the product works. They have to adjust their uh, methods of operations just to use some software. We don't believe in that. We believe that if a company is successful, something makes them successful. And technology cannot stand in the way of what makes them successful. So we love to build technology that actually works for our customers and that allows them to kind of adopt it as they need, not the, not the other way around. We also use open source as a strategy. This is a our go-to-market strategy, and we love open source. We actually think the philosophy behind open source is extremely important as well. But put philosophy aside, it's a strategic kind of move for us. We really believe that open source is something that actually works for everybody that's involved in this kind of uh, project. So um, it comes from, again, we like to build flexible and uh, uh, tools that can be extended and customized to the needs. So giving open source uh, technology is actually no limits on what you can do with that. But that also helps us to kind of build an ecosystem. Right, this, we're small. We started as a small company in, uh, in Los Angeles, and us being, uh, you know, a few years later in events in all over the world and here in France, cannot be done if we don't have an ecosystem around what we do. So we have a great ecosystem of partners, customers, developers, ourselves. We're all kind of pushing and building around our products, and that in turn creates this great vibe, as we call it, your vibe around what we do. And that helps our customers in turn to create a lower lower cost of ownership using our products because they have this. I, they can tap into this ecosystem, they can find developers, there's extensions, there's a marketplace, there's things that can build around that and help them actually bring down the total cost of ownership. Bring that, of course, if this, uh, the technology we're using is also open source, so it brings the licensing down and allows us to deliver products that are really uh, work for our customers. So we're open source, and um, one of the downsides of being open source is that we're, we don't really know everybody that's using our products, right? That's something that we don't have contact with everybody that's using it. We only know about people that are our customers and paying us to use it, and we'll talk about that later. But what we can track is any time somebody actually uses the application, because there's this thing that comes to us and asks for any kind of updates and any new versions of that, and we can track who's paying us. So we collect those uh, pings and just say how many people are using it, and then we kind of clean out 
any kind of domains that are dev domains and stuff like that, just to uh, make sure that these are people that are trying to actually use our application. So we call it active install of, the, of our product. And the number has been growing, and we just surpassed 130,000 live instances and uh, active installs of our products all over the world. So again, it's a great number, and this number continues to grow. So it's something that we're extremely excited about. But that gives us some kind of sense of how we're doing as a community around our product. So I mentioned the ecosystem, and our strategy of going to market uh, is we also have building this ecosystem, and we have this network of uh, global partners. Again, we're a company in the US, we kind of know, we hope we know a bit how businesses operate in the US, but we don't know how businesses operate necessarily in France or in Germany or other places. So we rely on our local partners in different markets in different countries to actually deliver our products to their customers in the right way. They also um, extend our product, build extensions to make sure that people in specific markets can actually use it. And um, so we definitely here in France, we have Sonolia and Nick DLZ that are our partners here. Um, we did one big mistake previously in a previous company that we basically opened it to anybody that wanted to sign up to become a partner. This time we were a bit more selective because we really wanted to have somebody that's our partner deliver products with quality. That just helps create a better ecosystem with better quality solutions. We also rely on some industry partners like Kenyo that is here, Alara, Morel, to extend the features that we actually have in the product and deliver even more uh, products and uh, community, and we just uh, announced a partnership with PayPal, I'm actually going out there um, right after I come back, uh, to meet about uh, how we actually revolutionize things for B2B. So they're extremely excited, extremely interested in that, and uh, we're uh, happy to have this partnership with PayPal. In terms of who uses our product, well, if we're successful doing what we do, we should get a very big variety of customers, and that's actually what we see here. We try to give kind of a sample of uh, some of our pain customers, and uh, a big thing to note here is that they come from completely different industries, completely different verticals in the industries. They, um, there are some companies here that generate a million dollars or a million euros a year, and there's some companies that generate over a billion dollars a year. There's different sizes, different requirements, completely different uh, things that they're doing with their products. For example, we have uh, financial advisor networks that help people buy life insurances and stuff like that. But then we also have a country that's managing all of its citizens' data and kind of, they call it the citizen relation management on top of our CRM product. So again, just building flexible tools that allows our customers to kind of build on top of that, create new solutions, make sure that the, the product that we build works for them and their needs. So again, this is a short list of some of our uh, customers. As we started um, <coughs> releasing the products and getting more and more uh, attention, we started getting more and more press coverage. And so far, most of it is positive, at least the ones I'm showing you here. <laughs> so we actually got uh, some positive reaction from the uh, uh, press all over the web, and then something that you want to read about what other people think about us, please do. Uh, we also work closely with analysts uh, on our products. We actually have a report coming out with uh, Frost and Sullivan, the Green Bowl right now, about the, how B2B uh, e-commerce is uh, growing. Uh, we work with Gartner and Forrester. Uh, Forrester actually, uh, Kate Le Leggett, uh, actually um, is really excited about our strategy of combining B2B e-commerce and CRM together. And we also, even though we just released our product for e-commerce beginning of the year, we were actually already getting the Forrester report for 2017. Again, for us, we're kind of proud of that. It's a big achievement to do that in such a short time. So, like I said, enough with the uh, out talk, as we call it. I want to talk to you a bit about our products and what we do. I know some of you already know it. We've been around for a while, but I'm I know there's a lot of new faces, so I'll give you a short introduction of two of our existing products and kind of give you a little bit more depth about our latest product, Oral Commons. So, Oral Platform. It's our first kind of product that we released to the world, and um, it's been around over three years. Uh, the idea of our platform came to me more from, um, again, my previous lifetime at Magento, and I, there was one thing I noticed was that a lot of developers and a lot of companies were trying to use Magento, but for something we didn't design it to do. And the idea was we designed uh, a platform to be an e-commerce, uh, B2C e-commerce platform, but then we started noticing that some people are using it for creating a file sharing system, for example, or community websites. And when I started talking to the developers that were doing that, the reason that they gave me for doing so was that 
or uh, sorry, that Magento had a lot of the features that they needed for their projects, and they thought by removing some of the features, they can save some time, right, and reuse some of the features that Magento already did. But that turned out to be a falsehood or <coughs> incorrect assumptions because Magento was, as we call it in technology, was tightly coupled a lot of times on a lot of features, and they spent a lot of time and effort just to removing features they don't need. So this time we decided, okay, if we're creating a new project, a new open source, maybe we help the ecosystem grow by doing a little bit more effort and releasing a project that is more general uh, purpose, and we call it the Oral Platform. And the idea about the Oral Platform is that we create a platform that allows other companies to create custom applications, but without the need to remove features that don't need to actually just use the features they do need. Uh, and the idea of Oral Platform is that it's a reusable, uh, uh, very intuitive, I would say, uh, complex, but it can help uh, companies move very fast on creating their own custom application for their own needs. So it's a lot of times called business applications or back office applications. Some of the features that come out of the box with this uh, platform are user and permission management, for example. We have a very robust ACL, access control level. Uh, this global search, so for example, as you add uh, data into the systems, you can search for it, the users can find the records really fast. Entity management, so you can create custom entities. Reports and workflow engine built in that you can reuse. The whole navigation, again, you can just tie into that as you add modules and, uh, and features to the product just to add it. Uh, system configuration and then reusable UI UX components that you can use and much more. So again, this is a project that we are releasing under um, OSL uh, license, so it's very uh, free uh, license to use and uh, you can be as disruptive as you want to do whatever you want to do or create your own custom application for your needs. We actually started getting some uh, companies that were building products on top of our platforms. So again, that's something that we were excited to see. And uh, Kino, which is um, a company that's going to be talking to you today, but uh, your CEO, President Dickelberg, is here, uh, used, using some of the components of uh, our platform. We actually wanted to use a bit more of it, negotiation. <laughs> um, but uh, Morello just released an open source ERP for commerce or uh, a kind of an order management system. And the Amanda Desk is an alternative to Zendesk. It's an open source ticketing system. Uh, kind of a tracking system. And of course, we ourselves use or or Serum and or Commerce. We use or Platform to create our own products. So again, this is uh, some uh, projects we are aware of, but there's a lot more companies that are using it for custom uh, projects that they're doing internally. They're not sharing it with other people. So again, if you're interested, if you're a developer, if Technology company or a company that needs a custom application, take a look at our platform. We might save you some time in development. So, our first commercial, I'll call it, or open source commercial product that we created, again, just about uh, over three years now, uh, is Aura CRM. And Aura CRM was our first product on the market. The idea was that we, again, from our experience working with merchants, they used to come to us as a system integrator ourselves. So and asked us to find the tool for them to do a better job on managing their customers. And as many other people, the first thing we did, we went to Google search and uh, put the term client relation management and we saw a lot of CRMs out there. The problem with those CRMs is that they don't really focus on client relation management. They more focus on leads and opportunities and uh, managing the pipeline and giving visibility to sales manager how the pipeline is doing. So they're more kind of, they look like a sales tool more than an actual relation management tool. But our customers at that time were merchants, they were selling online. And as such, because they were selling online, they, they didn't have leads and opportunities. So when we did this integration with Salesforce, which we should CRM, for example, we found that it doesn't necessarily fit the right way. So we would bring the shopping cart and then there was always this awkward question of asking, where do you want the shopping cart data? Do you want it as a lead or an opportunity? And the answer is neither. The answer is it's a shopping cart. So we want to read the data in the native format and do something with that data. So we decided that maybe it's time to rethink how we approach a CRM. And the other thing that kind of struck us when we started getting deeper into that and understanding what our customers actually need we found out that most of them don't only sell on their e-commerce web store, but they might have other channels that they sell on. And maybe they're selling on eBay, on Amazon, maybe they have a brick and mortar store and a POS system there that people are interacting with, their customers are interacting with. Maybe they have a customer support unit in the company that the customers call in, interact with, social, they have interactions with their customers on social. So they're not a single channel, and most companies, they are not a single channel, specifically when we talk about their customer relations. They have multiple touch points between themselves and their customers today. So we kind of took this multi-channel approach 
He said, okay, this is something you definitely have to build into Oral CRM. They actually built a real tool to kind of centralize the customer data for a company in a specific place, and we do think that the CRM is the place to do it. So everything we build in Oral CRM is multi-channel. <coughs> Sure, there's just one example, but this is a dashboard. The dashboard feature in Oral uh, Serum. And I know it's you probably all can read it, but for me it's, it's a bit fuzzy, so I trust you don't really see anything. But the idea is that uh, here there's a quick example of how we uh, present even the dashboard. So we can create a dashboard for every channel that you uh, interact with customers across. So we have here an example of a B2B, regular leads opportunities kind of way of the sales team looking at their data, but we also have a B2C e-commerce channel where we actually track how customers are, uh, how many visitors your website had, how many of them were actually browsing the site, how many of them were actually adding to cart, how many of them were actually converting to orders. So you can see this dashboard. And again, this is relevant data for the e-commerce channel, but this can be extended to other interactions. You can, you can look at the dashboard, for example, for your social interactions, for your customer support. And this is across the board in our CRM. Everywhere in our CRM, we have multi-channel in mind, and we support these kind of extensions of the uh, interactions with customers. By us bringing the data into our CRM, it allows us to create what everybody's talking about, the 360 degree view of the customer. Because we bring all this data, all these interaction points from, uh, that you have with your uh, customers into a single point, where we really can create what we call this customer view of your customer, and you can build an extended account uh, view or customer view to support all the data that you're bringing into a single place. And that's very powerful for a business to do because instead of having your data in silos or different applications, you can have it in a central place. And that allows you to create a really good customer experience. It's all about customer experience. We just had a, a webinar with uh, Forrester about it. And they believe that customer retention has to do directly with customer experience with your company. Somebody calls in and your customer support that says, I have an issue with online order. And the customer support says, well, I don't see it. That's a problem. They will not call back or will never shop with you again. Customer support needs to be aware of everything that's going inside the company with the customer. Again, based on permission, of course, but you want to uh, expose as much data to them as possible. And that's true for any kind of uh, interaction with the customer. The customer will feel much more satisfied, much more uh, confident in working with you if they know that you know how to interact with and of course, this can be tracked and across other channels. So, the uh, sales channel can actually see interaction with customer support. They can think if their customer is happy or unhappy and determine maybe better pricing. We also uh, kind of started working with marketers and understanding some of their problems. And when we started seeing their issues, we started thinking maybe the CRM is actually where market should start working as well. If you, in today, a lot of marketers, they have to use new online marketing tools or email marketing tools or uh, automated marketing tools, but the, the issue with them is that they do a lot of good things, but what they don't do is bring the data and allow them to actually signal the data in a proper way and an easier way. Some of them do that, but not all of them, and not all of them do a good, do a kind of good job. Of Since we're already bringing the data into the CRM, it's almost natural for a marketer to start building a campaign in the CRM, because they already have all the channel data of the customers. That's a lot, that allows them to create a segment of the customers, for example, Give me all the customers that bought online in the last 30 days and came to my uh, Paris uh, store and bought something on, and through the POS as well and spent more than a thousand euros. And I want to give them a 15% discount at the next order. They can do these campaigns and build these campaigns specifically in the CRM because we already have all these channels there. They can then also track the campaigns, see how they perform, and then even continue segmenting. So, for example, if they have a coupon for free shipping versus a discount. Maybe people that like free shipping, we can continue segmenting them and targeting them with a free shipping coupon versus wasting the time on campaigns of giving them this because they don't like it. So we really think that it's a powerful tool for marketers, and we see a lot of marketers that are starting to use our CRM to kind of segment the data, create better campaigns that are uh, more meaningful for their customers. I didn't forget about the sales and the uh, sales teams. So we do have two full feature B2B capabilities in our CRM. You can actually work with these opportunities and check the the, the channel, the sales channel, and see how you're doing. And um, the tools for uh, sales manager to build forecasts. So we still have all the regular features of all of the CRM. Okay, so let's talk about the, the latest product, Oro Commerce. Um, and uh, 
just want to say WorkCommerce is something that we just released uh, earlier this year. Uh, it came again from something we observed of how people were in, using uh, Magento and who is actually trying to use Magento back in the day. And uh, we started learning that a lot of merchants that came to Magento trying to use it were not necessarily B2C uh, or business to consumer kind of uh, merchants. And when we started uh, trying to understand what's going on, we saw that a lot of them were actually business to business, so B2B merchants that are looking to start going online. And that started to be a trend, and we saw, well, Magento is the most flexible tool we've ever built. They can use it for sure for doing B2B. And we started doing, even us as uh, Oro, when we were doing some uh, projects, we were trying to do B2B with Magento, but then we continuously hit walls where we found out Magento is flexible, but the amount of effort, the amount of work that we have to do with Magento to create a true B2B uh, e-commerce uh, application for our uh, customers was too much work. We ended up actually having to fork a lot of the basic features of Magento just to get some of these features done. And that in turn created a lot of uh, risk for our, the customers because they were basically using a, a fork version of Magento just to support what they needed to do with it. So maybe, you know, we started thinking about it and said maybe there's something we can do differently. Maybe we can build a tool that actually does B2B e-commerce, not the Magento that was designed to do B2C e-commerce. But before jumping into that, I'd like to work with data. I wanted to check how, uh, what the analysts uh, think of that market, and we actually were extremely surprised at the size of it. So uh, Frost and Sullivan, for example, say that in 2012, there was about $5.5 trillion in online transactions for B2B uh, e-commerce. And they expect that to grow in 2020 to about $12 trillion in online transactions that's a huge number, it's much bigger than BBC. So that means that more and more companies are starting to transact with other companies on the web. And that's something that made it very exciting for us, and we really believe that that is something that has a huge potential growth for anybody that's going to be doing this. So we, we talk about B2B, but let's define what we're actually doing with the product, what we're actually trying to solve. And there's three main use cases that we actually look at uh, when we talk about the oral commerce and what we're actually building out of the box for our users. Uh, so some of the, the, the first uh, kind of use case, we call it the self-serve model. And that has different uh, implementation, but there's one obvious one, where somebody just wants to interact with the website and do some stuff on their own, that's fine. That's kind of implied in the name. But the one that is not so uh, intuitive is that you might be a merchant selling to consumers all day long, you thought you're happy, you're growing, everything's good. But then one day a company calls me and says, well, we want to buy from your website. We saw some of your products, we have office managers, and we want to enable them to buy from your website. And your answer as a B2C merchant will be, sure, create an account, share the login information across your company, and enjoy it. Go for it. And that doesn't work. Because when a company buys from your website, they will come with a set of requirements in order to do that. For example, they'll have multiple users on their single account. Maybe all those users don't have the same permissions. Maybe they need to do and interact with the website differently. So it's very important that you allow, that you can actually serve companies in the e-commerce scenario just to allow them to buy from you. And if you don't think that it's important, if you don't think it's a big market, Amazon released last year a product called Amazon for Business, and that allows companies to shop on Amazon. Until today, we used to do that by sharing the login information, right? We say the credit card allows somebody to use it, but that doesn't scale for big companies. So Amazon has today a solution to allow companies to buy online from Amazon. So if you want to stay competitive, if you want to uh, allow more growth and allow companies to buy online from you directly, you should start looking at some sort of model as well for companies. The second use case is what we call buyer-seller uh, uh, interaction or salesperson interaction. And this is what we think of when we talk about BB. This is the world that uh, we're with a, a buyer that does some research, they maybe have some project that they're working on, maybe they just signed a new deal for building a new building, they'll start collecting all the materials and everything they need for them. So they'll do some research, once they found the company that sells the materials that they need, they'll uh, initiate a contact with them, request a quote. A seller on the other end, or a salesperson on the other end will send a quote, they'll negotiate back and forth the quote, when they're ready, the buyer will put in an order. Now taking all this process, that today is, as we call it, it's a pen and paper world, so it's uh, people interacting face to face in meetings, people interacting through fax machines, but they still exist and they exist in the B2B world. Um, Excel sheet. And if the company is really advanced, we see email even used. So it's something that we 
to really, I uh, think, that can go to the next generation, and that's taking it online. Everything we do today is online, Everything, all our interactions today are online, and the B2B world has to catch on that as well. So the buyer-seller interaction, taking that kind of interactions online, is something that we think is the core of B2B uh, e-commerce. The third use case is what we call marketplaces, and the idea there is that you have multiple sellers, multiple buyers, interacting, maybe uh, a buyer opens like an open bid that allows multiple vendors to bid on that. Um, but then, you know, the one thing that will come to mind is like Alibaba, and we're not necessarily focused on creating another Alibaba, although we have a customer that is doing that. Um, what we're focused is more about a central kind of focal uh, manufacturer or distributor that wants to augment their catalog. Maybe they want to offer other companies to offer their services on what they're selling and they want to do it in a single place because they get a lot of the traffic, a lot of the attention to their website, they want to extend what they do. So a B2B marketplace. So these three use cases is what we focus on with delivering with uh, oral farmers. Again, it is a platform. But a lot of the features we'll cover allow you to start from these starting points and develop, and develop uh, what you need for B2B e-commerce. So if you're still not convinced, let's talk a little bit about why uh, you should or shouldn't use a B2C e-commerce platform to do B2B projects. So let's start how B2B and B2C e-commerce are actually similar. There's a lot of similarities and a lot of trends that are actually causing people to think maybe I can just use B2C e-commerce for that. So uh, let's look at what some of the analysts like uh, Acuity Group here, for example, say that 94% of B2B buyers research online for purchase decisions. Now that should not surprise anybody here in the room. Everything we do today so most of everything we do today, we will start with the search online. And when you go to your work, when you go to your office, you'll do the same. You'll start searching online. So 94% of buyers already search online. But if we look at the B2B world, so many of these B2B companies are not even uh, searchable online. Maybe they have one page saying who they are, but their catalog is not visible. Their catalog is not indexed online. So making sure that when researchers or searchers or um, buyers are looking for you, they should find what they're looking for. So just this alone is something that we have to change. Seventy-four percent of the B2B buyers buy from the website because it's more convenient than buying from the salesperson. Again, Forrester says that, and it should be no surprise. Look at what's happening in the B2C world. All these stores, chain stores in the uh, U.S. are closing down because people would prefer to buy what they're selling online versus going into those stores. And the same thing is starting to happen in the B2B. Travel is expensive, it's difficult. If they can do something from their seat in their office or from their home office, actually, they will do that. So again, that's another trend we see that is um, really, of course, B2C is uh, on the forefront of that, but B2B is just behind that as well. Google, sell the, Google says that uh, nearly half of all B2B researchers are millennials. That should frighten them all of it. So that means our kids starting to work already. So um, millennials are becoming a bigger, bigger part of the workforce, and they're bringing their habits, the way of interactions, into the business world as well. So I don't know how many of you know millennials or how many of you are actually millennials, but um, I, I look at my daughter and I see how she is interacting with her friends, and it's completely different than the way we did it. So face-to-face -face meetings were good for our generation and the generation before us, but the new world is evolving, it's growing, and people are interacting in different ways. So this is how, when they join the workforce, they bring these habits with them and they interact with each other. Forty-two percent of the researchers use mobile devices purchasing process. Again, a trend that was very big in the B2C, moving everything into mobile. We see the same thing again in B2B. A lot of the transactions are done today in mobile devices. Again, you shouldn't be surprised with anybody. And also, by 2020, customers will manage 85% of the relationships with enterprise without interacting with the union. So in the B2C world, we see bots, we see all kinds of South sort of kind of things that customers can do. The same thing is starting to be prevalent in the B2B world as well. So again, very similar. Great user experience is something that we were talking about a lot uh, with B2C. You have to differentiate yourself, you have to be able to service as many people as possible on the website. So a great user experience is something that's a must. If somebody comes to a website and they cannot find what they're looking for easily, if they cannot check out easily, they'll hit the back button and go somewhere else and buy it there. Same thing is true for B2B. If you're creating a website for your customers in B2B and they cannot use it, they will not. They will either go somewhere else or maybe even worse, pick up a phone and have to actually. So, if 
you want it, if you want this kind of model to work, you have to create an intuitive uh, website that actually are and have great user experience. And again, in B2B, this is even enhanced because we have to also support not only our buyers, but also our salespeople. They have to use these systems. If they cannot find a good way to use it, they will not. Branding. Uh, in B2C, branding is how you differentiate yourself. In B2B, it's becoming more and more of a thing as well. Uh, here's an example of one of our customers, Samuel Hubbard, that actually has a really strong brand today that they're pushing, and they want this brand across their B2C and B2B uh, presence. And they want to maintain the brand. So there should be no limitations of what you can do with the design and branding of the website, even if you We've talked about a little bit of the similarity. Let's talk about a bit why it's maybe not, let's say that you just start with the BSC e-commerce platform, rather than starting with the dedicated B2B, um, and see some of the features that we think are really important for being successful B2B, uh, or having a successful B2B implementation. So one thing is the state of mind. And this is maybe obvious, but something we have to remind ourselves over and over again. When you're dealing in the B2B world, you don't talk to consumers, you talk to companies, it's not individuals. We have to see a company, we have to understand that this is not a single person shopping, it might be a, a team, it might be a group of people that have different roles, look at stuff differently, and we have to keep that in mind across the board with everything we do in B2B. In B2C, there's impulse buying. I need something, Go to Google, find it, find it for the best price, I order it, and I'm done. I need something else, I'll do the same thing over and over again. In B2B, it's process buying. It's something that a lot of buyers are putting effort into. They're doing research. It takes them a much longer time to actually put in an order. But that's how they work. And we have to have to build features that allow them to actually do these processes in the way they interact with your websites and uh, in the software model. Because that's how they're interacting. They're not being posted. They, they know what they're trying to achieve. So let's talk a little bit about what are key features and the capabilities that actually needed to be successful with that. So we talked about branding and B2C like a lot of people like to say, oh, the B2B world needs a lot of these B2C features. That's true, and we want to maintain branding like we said, but it has to be optimized for the B2B experience. If we just taking a B2C website and throwing our throwing on that uh, our B2B logo, users will not be able to use it. It's not the same feature set that they're actually looking for. Both of them have e-commerce in their title. They're doing completely different things. One of the things that we actually optimize in our commerce is actually allowing buyers and also sellers, by the way, to multitask. They're not single-minded, wanting to buy one item as fast as possible and get out of there. Actually interacting with your website. Like this might be a part of what they do during their work day. So if they're working on one quote and then their manager calls them and says, can you also start another quote? They don't need to delete everything they've done and start over. They want to save it and do it and start a new code. Or is the same thing. So they, they multitask, for example. They have to have a lot of these kind of features that allow them to be productive in working with your website. Otherwise, again, they will just not use them. So again, a lot of the buying experience of B2B is different than B2C, and a lot of these features are already baked into the world of commerce and should be in every B2B implementation. Corporate account, again, we mentioned it earlier, but that's an extreme, uh, extremely important feature in B2B. Again, we're working with companies, multiple users under a single account, different permissions, uh, different roles. A manager or an admin of these accounts has to administer these uh, users. They might want to add, remove users at the higher and higher, maybe promote somebody and change their roles. So they want to do this in a self serve kind of model. They don't want to pick up a call or uh, have a, an email to you to change a user that they hired and for you to act. They want to have some control on that. So again, it's a big feature that we have already built into Google Forms and allows you to actually build on top of that as well as you want. Personalized catalogs. In B2C, we try to put as many products as possible out there because we want to attract as many customers as possible. When it comes to B2B, the world is a bit different. B2B merchants a lot of times have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of SKUs, but not all of those products are relevant to all of their customers. That means that maybe they have customers from different industries, different uh, kind of needs, and they want to personalize the products that they see when they log into the site. They don't need to see only millions of products. This is even true if you dig deeper into a corporate account. Maybe some of the users, you don't want to make everything available to you. You want to make, for example, for office managers, being able to only buy paper and toner for your printer, but not to buy a printer. So limiting the catalog, the interaction of what they can actually do on the website is a key feature for B2B. 
multiple price list, this is like almost the heart of the B2B implementation. If you don't have this, you won't be successful in B2B. And the idea of price list is the ability to create a negotiated price or price book, as they call it sometimes, uh, for your customers. Because not all your customers are equal. Some of them generate a lot more revenue for you, and you give them better pricing. Some of them are just even they get default pricing. Some of them have contract pricing, different pricing for different contracts that they work with you on. And you need to maintain that. And if they don't see their pricing, again, they cannot use your website. So being able to kind of build this price list, and imagine again, we talked about the catalog size being hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of SKUs, add to this, or multiply it by all the permutations that we can have for the pricing, this is almost infinite size. So having a productive, I mean, an efficient way to display these prices, to work with these prices, both on the front and the back end, is extremely important. If you're integrating with an ERP, you can bring this pricing uh, from the ERP, but Showing it in the front is again something that has to be built and thought through, and we're investing a lot in this feature. It's a very difficult feature to build, and it's something we're actually building out of the box. I'll also add to that it's not only giving different pricing, it's even how um, your customers are actually buying. Some of them will buy boxes, some of them will say, Well, we actually buy it by weight because they buy different quantities, they have different needs. For the same product, they can buy it in, in different ways. So, pricing has to be extremely flexible for people. We talked about live cell interaction and how all this moves online. So some of the features that we already have baked in is, for example, a quick order form. Again, we talked about this process of buying, so a lot of time researchers and buyers, they put a lot of effort to research what they want to buy and they create this long list. And we were sometimes surprised at how long it can be. Sometimes it's thousands of line items in a single uh, request for a quote or, uh, or an order. But they don't interact with the website like regular customers in B2C. Well, they don't want to search, find, click, add. They might already have a prepared list. So they want to just upload the list of 1,000 items to uh, request a quote or an order. Or quickly find all the SKUs that they already know that they need. If you don't do this right, they'll just pick up the phone, call your salesperson, and start dictating to them or send, sending them an Excel sheet that they have to copy into their system. So again, some feature that is actually extremely important for the by selling interaction to actually work nicely. Quote to order and purchase uh, workflow or quote to order uh, workflow. Um, in the B2C world, we try to make it as easy as possible for anybody that will shop on our site. So we kind of aim the checkout process for the lowest common denominator that we can think of because we don't know who's actually shopping on our website. When it comes to B2B, it's not the case. So let's uh, give an example. Uh, I have a five step checkout, so we collect all the information. In we have this default checkout for all our users, and we think we did a good job. Then one company, and it's always the biggest company, if you know that, the biggest customer always comes with demands. The biggest customer will pick up the phone and says, well, I would love to use the website, but the checkout that you have that doesn't work for me. And the reason is because we have to approve by a manager every order over 5,000 euros. And you'll say, well, that's great. I'll hire a developer. I'll customize the checkout process once, and we're good. The problem is that then, Second largest customer calls and says that doesn't work for me because after that, after the manager approval, I also have to have a manager review before the order is submitted. So you see how this can go out of hand really quickly. So we took a different approach to how we do um, uh, checkout and uh, both uh, request and all that processes, and we actually built a workflow engine for everything. That means that we can support multiple multiple ways of interacting with the website, by the both on the front end and the back end all the major processes that you can think of. So requesting code is one of them. And different companies might have different processes and how they want to interact with you when requesting code or when submitting an order or when creating users for that time. So all these are workflow based. So you can support multiples of those, support really individual checkout per account if you want to, maybe even per role in your uh, organization, in your customer organization. <coughs> really robust feature that allows you to actually service your customer needs and make them use your platform. So we talked about the sales team and a lot of sales people called us and said that we're going to lose our job. We don't believe that's the case. We actually build these tools to support us, make them more uh, efficient, bring them to the way they want to integrate with customers. And that brings us back to, remember we have a product called Oro CRM. And guess what? A lot of the CRMs in the world are regarded by sales people as very unproductive tools they have to constantly update them with what they're doing so their sales manager can get a bit of visibility into how they're, uh, how they're performing. But once we put them together and they're seamlessly integrated with our CRM and our commerce, 
We actually make this a productivity tool for the sales team. They actually do what they need to do all day long, like create quotes, create orders for the customers, create pricing, and then they can actually track that through the CRM. So having these two products together is something that, again, we believe is a really great uh, strategy. Mobile, we touched on that, but we're running out of time, so I'll say this quickly. Mobile experience, again, it's really important, especially for B2B, everything's moving mobile. Uh, imagine the use case of having a sales rep standing on the floor in a convention or a conference and meeting a new customer, taking his iPad, <coughs> building a quote to him right in front of that customer, sending it to his email. That customer in turn goes on the way home, stands on the line to board the plane, opens his phone, sees the quote, approves it, and puts it in, uh, in as an order. All this process is possible today with mobile. We, uh, most of the pages in uh, Oral Commerce, both on front and back, end are mobile optimized, so you can actually have this experience and, the, and provide this for your buyers and sellers. Integration is extremely important. In B2C it's important, in B2B it's even enhanced. When we come to uh, the table and sitting and designing how oral commerce is actually going to integrate with the other solutions, there's so many of them, we have to be flexible because especially in B2B we find all these companies that have these legacy systems. Um, integration through email, FTP, these uh, first words come back to us. Uh, so we have to be very flexible. Of course we are covering everything with APIs if they're do this modern uh, approaches, but if not, we should support the ability to integrate oral commerce and the communication with any of the uh, technology stack that the customer might have. I'm going to touch about uh, how we go to market in terms of additions. Um, so we do have a dual licensing model, the same thing, similar to what we have in Magento. We have a community free edition and we have an enterprise edition. But one thing we learned that didn't work for us at Magento was how we were uh, differentiating so instead of differentiating based on features, we actually decided to differentiate on the stack that we're supporting and the ability to scale and performance of uh, the enterprise versus the community. So if you're a small business, if you're starting, or if you're trying to just uh, keep it going to the B2B world, online B2B world, maybe the community is good enough. And as you want to build scale, we're actually investing in testing scalability of millions of records um, and transactions on the enterprise edition. We support other tools and uh, third-party components to do that. And that's actually makes it a bit more complicated. So that support comes with enterprise. We also have features that are tied into the stack in order for them to be delivered. For like, for example, being able to run a multi-tenant almost uh, support for multiple organizations, multiple businesses in a single instance, multiple websites, multiple warehouses, and multiple currencies. Some of the so again, we just released the beginning of the year, but we're starting to get more and more customers signed up and starting to get the conditions in the works. Uh, we're going to have a talk from Market International, and some of the people that are implementing it here, so it's extremely excited. But we are getting traction all over the world for that. So with that, um, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here all day. If you want to, I don't know if we have Q&A now or not. If not, I'm here all day. If you have questions, please uh, come shake my hand, introduce yourself, and we'll have a discussion. Thank you very much.